Dr. Michael Best is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Graduate Department of Psychological Clinical Science and the, at the University of Toronto. He is a director of both the Therapeutic Interventions for Psychosis Lab and the Clinical Research and Evaluation Center at the University of Toronto. He also holds appointments as an affiliate scientist at Ontario Shores Center for the Mental Health Sciences and as a collaborator scientist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Currently, Dr. Best is conducting clinical trials examining remotely delivered individual CBT for psychosis mechanisms on change during CBT uh, for CBT psychosis and effective CBT training methods. And with all that, he has a nice young family, which I hope he gets to see sometimes, um, but he's a busy man. I just wanted to say that Dr. Best has his own practice, and uh, he is training many, C many therapists as possible in hospitals to do CBT for psychosis. Um, I'm very, I have taken many courses on CBT for psychosis, and I know that there are some um, people doing this work who are not trained uh, properly. And I would like to say Michael, Dr. Michael Best is one of the best. Um, and that's why his name is Dr. Michael Best. But anyway, I, it was my pleasure to introduce you and we are thrilled to have you. Joni gave me a, a lovely introduction there. Um, I do a lot of work on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for, for psychosis. Um, my primary position, like Joni mentioned, is at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, but I also have a, a small private practice on the side where, where we see uh, people for CBT for psychosis as well. And that work, um, we haven't done any clinical trials on it yet, but, but at our clinic, we often also see family uh, members and, and caregivers who have a family member uh, who's experienced psychosis because I'm sure as everyone's aware, it can be you know, a very stressful uh, experience to see someone you love go through psychosis as well. And so, you know, it's often um, something we do at the, the clinic is work with family members in terms of how to look after yourselves and also how to, how to best support your loved one uh, who's going through this. So I'm going to go through a number of things today. I wanna to give everyone kind of a, a brief overview of CBT for psychosis. Um, if you're not familiar with that, or uh, if you weren't able to attend the, the Home on the Hill talk a few weeks ago. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, really the role of, of families. And, and there's differing views, I would say, in terms of, you know, the role that families can play in, in the recovery process. Um, I'm gonna share my view on that. And, you know, I think the, the most beneficial thing um, that family members can do to, to help their loved ones with recovery, and then also enough strategies to help you, you know, take care of yourselves, um, help you keep yourself feeling okay, despite all of the, the stress that, that can come up and help you best support your, your loved one as well. So hopefully there will be a variety of topics that we end up covering today. And, and please do um, cut me off at, at any point. If you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those uh, along the way. So maybe as a starting point, um, I want to talk a little bit about CBT for psychosis and, and the evidence base that's there, what CBT for psychosis really is and the role that it can play in recovery. But I think more and more in you know, my group's doing quite a bit of work on, on this, but thinking about recovery from psychosis as being much more than just recovery from the symptoms that people experience. Symptoms are often what bring people into the mental health system in the first place, but typically when we think about recovery and living a full life, symptoms are only one part of the picture. Uh, and what we've been working on is, is this multidimensional model of trying to promote not just symptom reduction, helping people have fewer symptoms, helping people be less affected by the symptoms, developing coping strategies for those symptoms, but also helping people get back to a life that they want to live. And that can be, you know, different functional activities, maybe living independently, maybe volunteering or working, maybe going back to school, maybe just being able to do some activities of daily living that, that you weren't able to do before. And then there's this other domain of personal recovery, which is really focused on uh, aspects like hope for the future, connection that you have with other people, feeling of independence and autonomy, and like you can care for yourself. And I think a lot of this, uh, you know, this 
collection of domains of recovery is really what we want to go for when we think about recovery from psychosis. And oftentimes, for very understandable reasons, I think our, our healthcare system is mostly focused on, on the symptom-focused approaches and really trying to reduce symptoms and, and make symptoms go away. I think the other two domains are, are often uh, maybe underemphasized and, and more likely to be overlooked. But if we're really trying to promote recovery, live a full life, I think we want to be looking at all three of these domains here. I'll often use um, this analogy when I work with clients. Uh, it's an analogy of a, of a spiral staircase. And recovery is, is often a, a very long road for people. It's often quite a journey. And on that journey, you know, we often have ups and downs and, you know, go through periods where things are going well and go through periods where maybe things get harder for someone. And what can happen when you go through a period where things have gotten harder, maybe the psychosis has come back a little bit more uh, full force, can happen for, you know, our loved ones with psychosis, can also happen for, you know, family members and caregivers. But it's easy to fall into this trap of thinking that, oh, no, we're right back where we started. We're right back where we were, you know, a month ago, a year ago. We haven't made any progress on this recovery journey. I like this analogy of a spiral staircase, because if you think about going up a spiral staircase, every time you come around and you do one more cycle going up, you end up looking at the exact same view. And if you've, you know, if you've walked a spiral staircase, you can think back to, you know, coming around and, you know, you see the same thing. Maybe you see the same wall, you see the same view looking out. Um, there's, I've had a couple of places I worked that had nice spiral staircases with views where you actually looked out over the, over the city. Um, you come around to the same view each time, but it looks a little bit different. So you might be looking at the same thing, but now you're one, you know, circle higher on that spiral staircase, you've got a different vantage point. And so even though you're looking at the same thing, it's not the exact same situation. You are further along that path, you're further along climbing to the top of that staircase, even though what you're looking at right now is the same thing. Same thing with relapses and, and you know, those down periods where, where maybe the psychosis comes back really strong. It's not necessarily that we're right back where we were the first time or right back where we were a year ago. You know, we've learned things, we've progressed, even though we're dealing with something very similar, we might have a new view and we, maybe we've learned something since then that's going to help us propel us even more on this recovery journey. And I think it's helpful to keep analogies like this in mind as we think about, you know, especially as we think about our loved ones going through something like this, uh, you know, can be really easy for us to lose hope and uh, have some of these catastrophic thoughts that come up that things are never going to get better. You know, we're always going to be at this place. And uh, I think it's helpful to think it's a long process. We might be spiraling around this staircase. We might be coming around to the same view multiple times, but each time it's a little bit different. Each time we're a little bit further along this recovery journey. When we think about CBT for psychosis, um, really it's a, a psychosocial treatment, it's a talk therapy, um, but it's very structured. And so we have a number of different values that we hold when we do CBT for psychosis. One of them being that CBT, or sorry, that psychosis is only really a problem that we want to address in treatment. If it's distressing for the person or if it's really impairing their everyday life. So if psychosis isn't distressing or impairing for somebody, then it's not something we necessarily need to address in treatment. And this comes up with a variety of beliefs. Uh, and you know, we often think about unusual beliefs in the context of psychosis because they're beliefs that maybe other people in the person's life might not necessarily hold. That doesn't actually end up being that much different, you know, if you think about all the views that are out there, especially right now with you know, COVID vaccines, you know, political parties, there's lots of conspiracy theories floating around. People hold all different beliefs about these types of things, but it's not necessarily distressing or impairing to them. Same thing with the unusual beliefs that come up in psychosis. Some of them are not necessarily distressing or impairing. And if that's the case, you know, we wouldn't view it as something we need to work on in treatment. It's very collaborative. It's very much working with the client in terms of what is going to best help them in their recovery journey. Well, how can we best help, you know, these pieces that are the most distressing for somebody? 
tends to be a very goal-oriented treatment. So we develop goals collaboratively with the client. Um, we Our goal is always recovery in those three domains. So everything we do is try to, to help support that recovery. We do base it on a cognitive model. And later on tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the cognitive model, um, at least the generic cognitive model and how we might use that in the context of treatment. We spend a lot of time developing coping strategies. We do a lot of experimenting and testing out beliefs. So we do that both in session with clients and we do it outside of session. We'll often try and go out into the community with clients and actually spend time uh, testing out different beliefs and different ways of interacting in the world, in the real world with clients. We try and do action plans in between sessions. So there's always something that clients should be doing in between session to move that recovery along for themselves. And really the goal with CBT is that it's not a forever therapy. It's a short-term time-limited therapy. And at the end of it, we really wanna have a wellness plan in place for people so that they can take this wellness plan, apply everything that we've done in therapy, everything we've learned in therapy, and use that on their own to really support their life and, and live the life that they wanna be living. And this type of approach, you know, if we really do it in this way, in a way that's, uh, you know, in accordance with the evidence base that's out there. Um, and if anyone attended my talk, uh, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, you'll know I, I talk about evidence a lot because I think it's really important that if somebody is providing a therapy like this, it needs to be a, according to a model that we have some sort of research evidence for. If we don't have research evidence for the way it's being done, then why would we expect that it's actually going to be helpful for somebody? And like Joni mentioned, unfortunately, um, you know, there has been a fairly significant interest in the last well, maybe five years or so in organizations providing CBT for psychosis. And so there's more people out there saying that they do CBT for psychosis. The problem is that not everyone who says they're doing CBT for psychosis is actually doing it in an evidence-based way. And it's not the easiest, unfortunately, to find people that are doing it in a way that actually has research support to say that what you're going to do is helpful. I'll give you a few suggestions um, in a few slides of, of what to look for if you're interested in, in CBT for psychosis for, for any of your loved ones. Before we get to that, though, um, I'll go over this quickly, and then I want to show you some of the, the evidence for this type of CBT for psychosis, because I think a lot of it's actually very exciting and stuff that maybe isn't as, as widely known out there. But the values that we hold in CBTP, it's very much that, you know, many people experience psychosis, psychotic-like experiences. Not everybody has distress. And so we really focus in on what is the aspect of the experience that's distressing or impairing for the person. We work from a model that is very hopeful and optimistic that recovery is possible for everybody. For some people, it might take longer and we might need to spend you know, more time in different types of therapeutic modalities, might need to seek out different options. But you know, I've worked with people who were hospitalized for 30 or 40 years, who, who had been living in the hospital for 30 or 40 years. And we were able to work with uh, you know, people over the course of a year to 18 months and actually be able to get people living in the community now, not fully independently, um, but in a, in a group home and much more engaged in volunteer activities and that in the community, which is a huge step for somebody who, who's been in the hospital for, for decades. And so recovery is possible. It's going to look different for everybody um, and it's gonna take a different amount of time but it's certainly something that, that is there and, and possible. Every symptom, for at least from a CBT perspective, we view as being understandable. You know, even the, the most, um, what seems to be hard to understand, uh, unusual belief that's out there. You know, we typically, when we start working with clients, you know, we're able to, to understand why that belief might be there why that might've developed and, and why it keeps going. And once we have that understanding that we've developed together, that's really what we work on to help people with those types of beliefs. We also, you know, we really believe that there's no clear boundary between mental health and, and mental ill health. You know, there's uh, no fundamental difference between someone who develops psychosis and, and someone who doesn't. Um, I think that's not always the message that the, the medical system gives, unfortunately, but, you know, it's always a continuum and uh, 
some people, you know, at, when you're more stressed, you might move down that continuum a little bit more. You might have more of these psychotic-like experiences. When you're less stressed, you might have less of those. And all of us, you know, if we're sufficiently stressed, might undergo experiences like this. So our goal is really to work with people to develop ways of, of understanding their experiences that are going to be more helpful in their everyday life. Now, the evidence, I think, this is where it gets exciting in, in a number of different ways. The evidence is actually quite strong when it comes to this type of CBTP um, in terms of improving functioning, improving personal recovery, and improving symptoms for, for people who have experienced psychosis. This is a, a large meta-analysis of about, uh, I think it's about 35 uh, randomized controlled trials of uh, formulation-based CBT for psychosis. And a meta-analysis basically combines all of these studies together to estimate how effective is this treatment. If you look across all of these different studies and all of these different uh, uh, people and groups doing the, the same intervention approach. The effect size that we get out here is very similar to the average effect size that you get out for any psychotic medications. And almost all of these trials with the exception of two, I think, are for people who are already taking any psychotic medications. And so what that essentially is telling us is that if somebody's already taking medications, hasn't had a full uh, you know, response to it, is still experiencing symptoms, the amount of improvement that you got from you know, starting to take the medication, you could hope that you would get the same amount of improvement um, if you start taking CB or if you start CBTP in addition to the medication. Or if medications haven't been successful, uh, you know, uh, I'll show you some evidence uh, uh, about that in a minute too. But if medications haven't been successful for someone, you know, CBTP is, is very reasonable and you could expect, you know, uh, a decent response potentially from, from CBTP. So this is, you know, the average across that 30 to 40 studies there. Now, if we look more specifically, um, this was a, a clinical trial looking at people who refuse medication. Um, so for a variety of reasons, people might choose not to take any psychotic medications. Um, and what was done was people were randomized to either their treatment as usual, which essentially was some case management, but nothing more than that because you know the, they didn't wanna take medications for whatever reason, or randomized to receive cognitive therapy. And the cognitive therapy in this uh, trial lasted nine months. And so at that nine month point, cognitive therapy ends and all the improvement you see after nine months is that uh, continuing improvement that we always hope to see following cognitive therapy. So if people are taking the skills they've learned in therapy and continuing to use it, what we hope to see is that those improvements maintain and even get better over time. So lower scores on this scale are, are better. So that means fewer symptoms that the person is experiencing. And what you see is a, a, a very substantial drop actually for people who receive cognitive therapy. So even if somebody's not taking medication, cognitive behavioral therapy can actually be very useful in terms of reducing symptoms and, and improving functioning. Following on that trial, this is some work from Tony Morrison, who's in Manchester in the UK. He's done some of the, the really exciting work in this area. Um, this was a trial where people with a first episode of psychosis were coming in for treatment for the very first time, and they were actually randomized to receive CBT or antipsychotic medication or a combination of CBT and antipsychotic medication. And treatment here lasted 24 weeks. So that 24 week time point is when treatment ends and the 52 week, that last time point that's there, that's the follow-up. So that's even after treatment is done. Um, if you see when treatment is, when CBT is actively going on, you actually get the best uh, effect from CBT plus medication. Um, if you look at that 52 week mark by the time people are, uh, that's about six months after the end of treatment, um, all of the conditions are at exactly the same point. So regardless of whether you get just CBT, just medication, or a combination of CBT and medication, you know, people are experiencing the, essentially the same amount of reduction in symptoms. So again, it, you know, it's another option for people um, to, that CBT, if it's provided in a competent, effective way, it can actually be as effective as, as medication. And I always say, you know, that's not necessarily a reason to go off meds or not take meds in the first place, but it's all about finding what works.
works best for for different people for some people you know medication is going to be the way to go it's going to be amazingly helpful for other people it might be cbt that you know is the is the really helpful thing we don't really have any evidence at this point to say who is most likely to benefit from one over the other so it's really about finding what approach is going to work best for for who and you know in a lot of ways it's just trying these different things out and and seeing what's most effective if you look for people in the high risk uh, state, so this is actually people before you develop psychosis, um, but who are starting to experience the very earliest signs of, of different symptoms. If you look at people in that state before people actually go on to develop a, a psychosis, if you provide CBT, um, you can actually decrease the likelihood of developing psychosis by 50%, which I think is a, a pretty substantial and, and really huge reduction in, in the likelihood of developing psychosis. So again, some, some exciting data on the CBT front. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, people who have treatment resistant symptoms and people who, um, you know, have been on multiple antipsychotic medications, often people who have tried clozapine, which in a lot of ways, clozapine is kind of a, an amazing and uh, antipsychotic medication. When you look on the research front, it's it's by far the most effective antipsychotic um, if people are able to be on it for, for all the physical health reasons. But even if clozapine doesn't uh, you know resolve all symptoms, CBT still produces uh, you know a significant effect uh, reduction in those symptoms for for people who are still experiencing those treatment resistant symptoms. And when you look at people who, this is another trial, this is a trial of people who had been hospitalized, you know, for, for decades often um, with these very persistent uh, negative symptoms, which is much more focused on things like motivation, difficulty expressing emotion, difficulty experiencing any joy or pleasure from anything in life. Um, this was a longer trial. So this was 18 months of, of cognitive therapy. Um, the graphs are kind of confusing, so don't worry about the graphs, but essentially what it shows is that on every domain of these symptoms and an even stronger effects on functioning and living independently, um, you get significant improvements. This is 18 months of treatment, but again, these are people who, you know, had experienced very persistent symptoms for, for decades. Um, and even then, you know, CBT is able to, to have a pretty significant effect in terms of people's well-being. This is a, a graph from uh, our current CBT trial that we have going on. This is the, the average improvement that we're seeing across sessions. So the numbers on the bottom there are each session that we have, and people have uh, a maximum of 26 sessions in this current trial that we have going on. And as you can see, you know, uh, kind of like that spiral staircase, um, imp even improvement through CBT, it's, it's not a linear improvement, you know, each week, you know, you tend to get these ups and downs that happen for people. It tends to be, you know, one week things are going well, maybe the next week things are a little more challenging. But if you look over the course of time, you know, you get a pretty nice trend where people on this scale, you know, are starting out in the in the 25 range and are ending up at about double that. The, the maximum on this scale is a 60. Um, this is a personal recovery scale. So this is how, essentially how recovered um, people are on, on all of those domains that that I talked about previously. And essentially, you know, if you think about those values, you're getting almost a doubling in terms of how how recovered people are reporting that they are in, in these areas, which again, you know, I think very exciting when we think about cognitive behavioral therapy for, for psychosis as a treatment option. Now, based on all of that evidence, um, CBTP is recommended in, in guidelines, you know, um, international guidelines, guidelines in Ontario, Health Quality Ontario has guidelines for both inpatient and outpatient um, delivery of CBT for psychosis. Um, and, uh, you know, really the goal is that everybody who has uh, experienced psychosis should be offered CBTP uh, at some point. Um, ideally, the sooner the better. Um, but the goal is that everybody's going to be offered CBTP. The problem, and we can talk about this a little bit if people are interested, but um, the guidelines all say that it should be a minimum of 16 sessions that are provided. Um, the research actually says it's more like 24 sessions where you see uh, you know, the most sustained improvement for people. 
So oftentimes what we're seeing in hospital settings, unfortunately, um, is that people aren't being provided the full length of treatment or the full treatment package that we would hope. Um, and, you know, it might be not in a method that's actually been evaluated in a, in a lot of these clinical trials. And so that's where, you know, thinking through what is actually competent CBTP. Oftentimes we have to um, work with clients um, who have had what they thought was CBTP in the past, but it wasn't necessarily, you know, delivered in this evidence-based way. And that can be a challenging barrier to overcome when people have had CBTP before and say, you know, it, it wasn't helpful. You know, it, it didn't help me or, or it helped me a little bit, but I think I've got all I can out of it um, when it wasn't actually delivered in, in the most evidence-based way. And so, you know, overcoming that sometimes is the most challenging thing to, to get people into therapy um, to be able to say, you know, this might be slightly different than what you've done before. And, you know, we could give this a try and, and see if it's actually going to be helpful. The, the biggest things, if you're ever looking for, for a CBTP therapist uh, for a loved one, you, know, you really want to ask the, the potential therapist about their training. You know, where did they get their training? Who did they get their training from? Um, are they currently being supervised or do they have any consultation um, from someone who, who, you know, knows about this type of formulation based CBTP? You want to make sure those CBTP values that I mentioned before, you know, things like um, these types of experiences are actually normal human experiences, the, the recovery dimensions that we're working away on, things like doing activities in between sessions and making sure there's things going on in between sessions. We want to make sure all of that's going on because if it's not, you know, it, this isn't the same type of CBTP that, that's been evaluated in the clinical trials that are out there. We want to make sure there's goals. If there's no goals in the therapy that someone's doing, it's not CBT. Um, if there aren't agendas being set, you know, so at the beginning of each session, you know what you're going to do and that that's being set collaboratively with the client. It's not evidence-based CBT. Um, one of the, the biggest things that I'm always on the lookout for is therapists or this, you see this a lot in hospitals. Um, unfortunately, where things maybe are more group-based and, and less individual therapy, but this idea that CBT for psychosis is, is skills and it's just skills. And you'll find therapists, unfortunately, who it's all about, you know, just giving worksheets or, or trying out new uh, coping strategies. If that's all the therapy is, again, that's not evidence-based CBT for psychosis, unfortunately. It might be very helpful in a lot of ways, but that's not the type of CBT that's been evaluated in these clinical trials. The other thing that I don't see done very often is we actually want to have sessions in the real world with the client. And so ideally your therapist should actually be not every session, but at least once or twice during the course of therapy, actually meeting up with a client, you know, doing an experiment in the real world. Maybe you meet at a coffee shop or a mall and do an experiment, or maybe you have a, a phone call while the client goes out and, and actually tests something out in the real world. But something should be done in terms of actually meeting the client where they're at in their community, their environment, and, and doing a therapy session there. Again, not something I see very often from, from therapists, unfortunately. Um, all of that to say, you know, sometimes it ends up feeling a little bit pessimistic that, you know, we've got this great uh, therapy that's out there, but it, at least in the Ontario context, it, it can be rather hard to, to find therapists who are trained in, in this way. But we are working on that. You know, we, we just finished a, a, a big training initiative for a number of hospitals across Ontario to start to get clinicians trained. So not all the hospitals I would say are fully trained, but you know, we've got a few of them where there's a really solid CBTP um, group that, that are doing CBTP there now. Uh, and I do a lot of training actually uh, in, through, my, through my clinic of, of clinicians. So we're starting to get people uh, a much bigger base in, in Ontario built up uh, who can provide CBTP. Now, I'll have my um, email address at the very end. Um, I'm always very open to, to receiving emails and questions from anyone, um, especially around this, because I'm a, I'm a big fan of trying to help people find quality CBTP that gives you the best chance of, of actually supporting recovery this way. So 
you ever have any questions about, you know, places that, you know, maybe have the training to, to do this type of CBTP, or if you're looking for a specific therapist and, and you're curious about their background and you're not sure, I am very happy to receive emails. Um, I do receive a lot of emails, so it might take me a few days to respond, um, but I'm very happy to receive emails and answer any questions you might have uh, about, you know, anything CBT related at, at any time. Okay, I see a question in the chat. What if the client does not feel their unusual thinking is something that warrants CBTP? How to encourage them to try this? Um, that's, I would say that's actually very common. I would say that's probably the, the standard that we see most of the time for people who have uh, at least the unusual beliefs um, sort of uh, uh, experiences that go along with psychosis. Oftentimes, you know, CBTP, we're not just focused on those. We're really focused on on building that life that people want to live. So if there's any aspect of life, you know, um, if people aren't able to socialize as much as they would like, if people get anxious in different social situations, if you find your mood drops or you're depressed, uh, you know, if you're not working and you want to be working, you know, if you'd rather be living independently and you're not really any of that is fair game for, for CBT. And so our goal is usually, you know, whatever the client wants to improve for themselves, that's what we're going to work on in, in CBTP. So if there's anything like that, that they're interested in, in working on, you know, that's the, the starting point that we really go with. Uh, if someone doesn't believe they're ill, can this be used? Most definitely. Um, the challenge that we run into um, potentially with that um, is that uh, if people really don't want to be involved in therapy or services or, or anything at all, that, that can be challenging. Um, what we often try and do is spend a bit of time just engaging people. And, you know, I think one of the benefits to, to CBTP, if it's done properly, um, is that it really doesn't require that the person, you know, acknowledge that they have uh, a mental illness, really doesn't require um, that the person... Um, you know, want treatment for any of the things that maybe they've been told are, are symptoms in that. As long as there's something in their life that isn't going the way that they ideally want it to be, that's the entry point that, that we try and use. And oftentimes, you know, these unusual beliefs and that might be a, a barrier to getting the thing that the person wants. But really, you know, working away towards whatever the person's goal is, as long as we have some sort of goal that we can work towards together, that's our, our starting point. And even if the person, you know, often clients come in and, and don't necessarily have a goal on their mind that they want to work towards, the, the first phase of treatment that we always have is just you know, getting to know the person, getting to know each other. Um, oftentimes, you know, it might actually even be just going out for a coffee together and, and seeing if this is something that, that they want to pursue. So typically we'll try and do a lot to engage people in the first place, as long as they're willing to talk to us. You know, uh, if someone doesn't even want to talk to us in the first place or talk to a therapist in the first place, uh, that's pretty challenging. Um, but as long as they're willing to talk to us, then if you've got a good CBT uh, therapist, usually we can find something to, to work towards together. And there's another question in the chat. Can CBTP be effective during acute psychotic episode or... They need, or do they need to be stabilized on medication first? Very good question. Um, I would say this is um, one of, I have several, but this is one of my biggest pet peeves about um, uh, hospital policies. And there are some hospitals, and I am actively working to promote change in this, um, that have that view that CBTP should only be offered after somebody is stabilized on, on medication. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Some of that evidence I presented uh, a few minutes ago in terms of, you know, CBTP producing equivalent outcomes in enough ways to, to antipsychotic meds would say people don't need to be stabilized. And, and for context, actually, for our current, um, we, we just finished a clinical trial, actually, we just finished recruitment for it. Um, for that trial, um, and most of our trials, uh, it's actually an inclusion criteria that people be in the midst of, of active psychosis. And so be, you know, you're actively experiencing symptoms of psychosis. So not only is it, you know, uh, ineffective for people in the midst of a, an acute episode, um, at least for our trial, that's who we actively recruit. And, you know, we see pretty, pretty good results from it. So certainly in the midst of, of an episode, um, it can be very, very useful. When I look at a therapist for my son, they want to know what the voices say. 
My son doesn't want to divulge that because it's traumatizing. I always ask the therapist if they do reality testing and go back to where it all started, and they say it's not necessary, which I think is incorrect. You know, I think there, there's a lot we can do if we know what the voices are saying. Um, it is not uncommon that people are not interested in sharing what the voices are saying. Um, it's also not uncommon with voices that you may not necessarily even fully know what they're saying. It can be a very confusing experience for people. Um, you know, we, we don't need, well, you shouldn't need to know the voice content to still be able to do the work. Um, it, it's certainly helpful in terms of some of the things we might do in CBTP, but like you're saying, there's a lot of other work that, that we can do that you don't even need to know the voice content around to, to be helpful. Some therapists say that at some point the person will be able to move forward and the voices will no longer be an issue. Do you find that in your practice? Sometimes. Not mm -hmm. for everyone. So sometimes you, sometimes, you know, Sometimes we have really amazing results, actually, um, and sometimes the voices do just disappear, which, you know, is incredible. Um, I would say more often than not, it's not necessarily that the voices disappear, but they become, you know, less loud, less interfering. Um, the relationship that the person has with them changes. Um, often if you work with somebody long enough, you get closer to, you know, the voices being completely gone um, within the time frames that, you know, people are sometimes able to work in therapy, you know, if we're talking 16 sessions, it's, it's a lot to ask that the voices are, are going to be gone in 16 sessions. But mm -hmm. if you get up to more like, you know, 26 to 30 sessions, six months to a year, mm -hmm. you know, your chances do increase. It's, it's certainly not guaranteed and not everybody's going to experience that. But, you know, we certainly see that uh, for some people. As a caregiver, can I learn these techniques myself to help my loved one? I'll give you my opinion on that. Um, right up front. And I actually think that that's not the most beneficial thing that families and, and caregivers can do for your loved one. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, you know, there are people out there who do trainings and, and, you know, have a differing view. So, you know, keep that in mind. I think the main reason that that's not the best thing that we can do for our loved one is that it actually might take away from some of the, the most important, uh, you know, recovery-based work that, that you as a family member or caregiver can do. And the, the most important thing, at least in my view, is the connection that you have with your loved one. You, I, I'll show you some reasons why I think that's the case. Um, the issue as soon as we start trying to have families and, and caregivers really do the CBT work with loved ones, and I know there's organizations that, that do this type of training, but the risk you run is potentially um, putting up a, a little bit of a barrier or, you know, taking it outside of the, you know, the family supportive context and you run the risk of, you know, this kind of weird in between of, you know, therapist and family member support and, and trying to wear both of those hats, which isn't typically terribly useful. You know, from a therapist's perspective, I would never treat a family member or a friend or, or anybody that I know, actually, because it, it just gets so complicated. Oftentimes, the things, you know, clients want to work through might actually be related to family members as well. You know, there might be things that they don't necessarily feel comfortable talking to family members about. And so, as those things start to come up, it can actually start to put up, you know, a little bit of a wall in, in that connection. And I actually think that the, the most important thing that family members and, and caregivers can do is build that connection and facilitate that connection with their loved ones. It, you know, it's something that this is, we've known this for a long time in, in the psychology literature, but connection is the best thing you can do for physical health, mental health, overall well-being. It's a fundamental human need. And I think when we see family members and, and caregivers satisfying that need and having that strong connection with your loved one, that's where we see the, the best results in terms of recovery, actually. There's some really interesting data that I'll, I'll present in a minute. Um, social isolation um, is basically anything bad you can think of, social isolation is, is associated with it. We have a lot of research evidence for this, you know, um, premature death, people who are socially isolated and lonely tend to die on average 10 years sooner than people who aren't lonely. You have an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, dementia, 
any mental health difficulty, quality of life is reduced. You know, people tend to have poorer nutrition, tend to have more cognitive impairment. Basically, social isolation and loneliness is, is one of the worst health-related um, things that, that you can deal with. And unfortunately, psychosis is a very isolating experience for people. And I think that's where you know, people's social networks tend to shrink once you have psychosis. And you know, as a family member, being part of that network and helping expand that network is amazingly helpful. It's also, I think, where you know, thinking about all of those domains of recovery is very helpful because symptoms is only one of those. And, you know, it's very possible to still live a meaningful life, even if the symptoms aren't fully gone. Um, the, what we know, so go over this quickly, but when it comes specifically to psychosis, if you're socially isolated, if you're lonely, if you don't have a support system, you tend to have more severe symptoms. You tend to not actually respond to medications or psychosocial therapies as well. So you actually have greater treatment resistance. You tend to have reduced recovery outcomes, reduced quality of life. You're less likely to be able to live independently. You have more cognitive impairment and you have reduced vocational outcomes. And it isn't that those factors lead you to be more socially isolated. It's, it's the reverse. Social isolation actually makes these factors worse for somebody. So again, the best thing I think we can do from a support system perspective is build that connection with our loved one as, as much as we possibly can. And anything that risks that even a little bit, I think we want to steer away from. The, so the really interesting piece of data that, that I would throw out there that I would say really supports this and would support, you know, would make me question trying to apply the, the CBT skills within the family context is this, there's a, a bunch of research on this now um, about outcomes in low and middle income company countries. There's a lot of this work that's been done in, in India. And what you actually see, so in India, um, you actually have less prescription of medications. You have way less access to the men to mental health system. So in India, you're, you're much less likely if you have psychosis to actually be involved in the mental health care system at all. Um, and yet, outcomes are better for folks with psychosis in India. You have better recovery outcomes. You have fewer symptoms long-term, fewer um, relapses that, that occur. People have much better recovery outcomes. Um, there was a really interesting study done between Montreal um, and a site in India looking at these types of outcomes for people. And the, the biggest reason, uh, and that held up um, as well, so that finding that recovery outcomes are, are better in India than they are in Canada, um, which might be somewhat surprising. The, the biggest reason that that seems to be is that there is more family support in India. So in India, what happens is the family rallies around the person with psychosis and the person with psychosis actually ends up with more support, more connection to facilitate that recovery process. Unfortunately, in, in Canada and more you know, so-called developed countries, again, we tend to see those relationships dissipate and, and disappear a little bit. And so that, you know, all of that research, again, to me says that the best thing that family can do to support recovery is do everything you can to enhance the connection and the relationship that you have with your loved one. I'm hoping we have time to, to watch a, a YouTube video. Um, some of you might have seen this before, some of you might not, but I, I, I think it also speaks to the importance of that connection and you know, doing everything we can to, to actually facilitate this connection. I'm a clinical psychologist who for 30 years has been working with people with schizophrenia, bipolar, and related psychotic disorders. Now, some people still think schizophrenia is split personality. I think it's worth taking a moment. When we talk about these, these psychotic illnesses, we're talking about neurodevelopmental disorders like Parkinson's disease, where the person doesn't have Parkinson's disease all their life. They develop it later. Same thing with these disorders that I'm going to be talking about. The other thing is, I think, a word about psychosis. What is it? It's really a couple of symptoms that we see most often. False perceptions, hallucinations, hearing things, hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, um, and having delusions. I'm not talking about political opinions. <laughs> I'm talking about fixed false beliefs, 
Sometimes they're bizarre. There's an alien implant in my brain. Or sometimes they're not so bizarre. Uh, my wife is having an affair on me. For many years, I worked as a clinician trying to help people with schizophrenia, bipolar, and related disorders. And I heard over and over again, I'm not sick, I don't need your help. You're the crazy one, not me. And as it turns out, about half of all people with these illnesses do not take medications that have, from the view of other people, helped them. So what is this problem? Uh, what are the lessons that we learned? And when I say we, I'm talking now about my colleagues at, at Columbia University, where I, I worked for two decades doing research. What we uncovered were two main lessons I want to share with you today. First, it's typically not denial when someone says, I'm not sick for months, years, and even decades. And two, the, the way we were speaking to our patients was making things worse, far worse. So let me start at the beginning. The beginning really starts with my brother Henry, who developed schizophrenia back when I was 21 years old. This is a picture of Henry and myself after we had immigrated from Cuba. This was on the heels of the Cuban Revolution. Um, that's me driving the car and Henry looking through the window. Uh, Henry was much more than a brother. He was a father. He was, as I said at his eulogy, Henry was my rock. He really was a mature, responsible person. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the story of this research is all about relationships and what happens between family members and healthcare professionals who are trying to help people with these serious mental illnesses. 20 years after this picture was taken, my brother developed schizophrenia. He heard voices, the voice of the devil, out loud, just like you can hear my voice. Now, he didn't think I have a problem, I'm going to go see a doctor. He thought it was the devil. He had delusions. Our mother was in cahoots with the devil. Her eyes were laser beams. This is where it got a little bit bizarre. And uh, she was actually cutting him, lacerating him. He tried to show me the wounds. Of course, there were no wounds. For a week, I argued with my brother. I begged him to go to the hospital. At first, I gently explained to him, Henry, you're not thinking straight. Something's clearly wrong. For a while, I thought he might be on drugs. That wasn't the issue. After a week of gentle persuasion, it turned into harsh confrontation, accusing him of being immature, irresponsible, uh, not caring about our poor mother. She, hasn't she been through enough trying to make him feel guilty? I got him into the hospital like many, many families, millions, at least three and a half, four million families in America have been through this experience. I had to call the police and he was involuntarily admitted to the hospital. Over the course of a month, and, and, and you know, don't faint, but back then, in the 1980s, people could stay in the hospital for that long. He got better. Antipsychotic medications eliminated the hallucinations, eliminated the delusions, and he promised he would take his medication. I came home, where did I find it? In the trash can. And what followed was seven years of my brother and I butting heads, me telling him, you're ill, you need help, please get help, him saying, no, I'm not, nothing's wrong with me. And what did our relationship look like? Like this, him running away from me and running away from all the people who were trying to help him. Not much of a relationship. He was homeless for a while, he was picked up by the police a lot, never broke laws, thankfully. During that same time, I was being trained as a clinical psychologist, and I picked up some gems, and probably the, the most important tool I picked up was not from a psychiatrist or psych psychologist, it was from Albert Einstein. It was the definition of insanity. I was doing the same thing over and over and over again for seven years while he was running away from me. He was being involuntarily admitted, almost 30 hospitalizations. While I argued with him, Henry, you're sick, you need help, please get help. Over and over again, expecting a different result. I called my brother, we had a conversation, we got together, I promised him I would never again tell him he was mentally ill. This is after seven years of trying to convince him. And I also did some other things I'm going to tell you about that are based in the research my colleagues and I have done. Our relationship changed dramatically. And with that, he accepted treatment. And in fact, in the next 18 years, our relationship looked like this. This is a picture taken out here. That's my brother on the right. That's me with a Jerry Seinfeld haircut. Um, <laughs> the way it looked back then. 
Um, now, that's not a delusion, me thinking that was cool. That was just style. <laughs> Henry, um, look at the way he's holding me. I actually can't look at this picture uh, myself anymore without getting very emotional. But if you can look at the way he's holding me and smiling at me, you know, sometimes a picture truly is worth a thousand words. The love was back. The trust and respect were back. And importantly, he was taking medication reliably for 18 years, one hospitalization truly voluntary. He checked himself in. He called me and said, I'm going to the hospital. So this is the foundation of a lot of insights of my own. It led to a lot of research that our group did at Columbia University and people around the world followed up on. It's now in our diagnostic manual for mental disorders. I was asked to submit the text on the latest edition of this, which came out in 2013. So I'm going to summarize some research in just one minute. What do we know? We know that unawareness of illness, notice we don't use the word denial, is typically a symptom of the disorder, like a hallucination. And it's very much like what we see in neurological disorders. If you've ever worked with neurological patients, as I have, you sometimes see people who are paralyzed and they don't know it. That symptom is called anosognosia. It's a tongue twister. I didn't come up with it. It was a French neurologist in 1919, Babinski. So if it's anosognosia, that already starts to suggest we should be talking to people differently about their illness, not trying to educate them. I wouldn't tell someone to stop hallucinating. Jeez, just stop being delusional. Stop hallucinating, because it's not under their control. But that's what I had been doing for many years with not only my brother, but many patients. This symptom, and again, this is in our psychiatric manual for mental disorders, even though it's still not widely known in our field, is the most common predictor of who will not take medication. 50 to 75% of people with these disorders do not take the medications that reduce those symptoms I've been telling you about, the psychotic symptoms. It predicts all kinds of problems, poor course of illness, involuntary hospitalizations like my brother had, and even aggression and violence. And of course, we know some of the stories that have hit the headlines in some of the cases I've worked on, like Theodore Kaczynski, who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, never understood he was ill. So I'm talking about this, but what does it feel like to have anosognosia? For this, I need a volunteer, someone who uh, is married, you don't have to be happily married, just married. Could you raise your hand if you're married? Sir, can I ask you to help me right there in the yellow shirt? Sure. What is your first name, sir? Richard. Richard, I'm actually uncomfortable doing this. This is a, a strange thing I've been asked to do by your family. How long have you been married to your, to your wife? 46 years. 46 years. What's her first name? Eleanor. Eleanor. And where is she? In New York City. Yeah. I've been asked to do an intervention with you. You're not actually married to Eleanor. Um, I have restraining orders backstage. I can, I can bring you back here and show them to you. Eleanor and her husband and family have been stalked by you for at least 20 years, I'm aware of. If I showed you those restraining orders, would that help you to understand? I don't think so. You don't think so? Shh, no laughter, please. Would they convince you? No. Okay. When you leave here... When you go home, where will you go? To my house. To his house. Is that the house Eleanor lives in? Uh, when she's here in Orient, yes. Yeah. Well, the neighbors see you, they call the police, and you end up in front of a judge, what's called a diversion court. And the judge says, Richard, I have really almost 10 years of paperwork here on you, on your rap sheet. I understand you have a mental illness. You believe you're married to this woman, Eleanor. You violated the restraining order again by going to her home. Now I'm the judge. I'm going to give you a choice, Richard. You can go to the hospital, and we'll adjourn your case of trespassing. And by the way, let me ask you something, Richard. When you went to the house and the police showed up and told you you weren't married to Eleanor, this was not your house, do you think you would resist going with them? In all likelihood. In all likelihood. So I'm the judge again. So Richard, I have also a, a charge of resisting arrest here. So I'm giving you a choice. You can go to the hospital. We've arranged something here close by and get some psychiatric help. And in six months, we'll review and maybe dismiss these charges. Or you can go back to jail and we'll have an arraignment on Monday morning. You'll spend the weekend in jail. What would you like to do? What do you think you'll do? Hospital. Hospital. Wonderful choice. So you go to the hospital. 
They relieve you of your clothing. They put your personals uh, in a plastic bag. Then they give your clothing back. They take your vital signs. They offer you medication. This one here is for the delusions that you have. This one here is for anxiety. And this one here is for side effects. The nurse gives you the cup. What do you do with it? I would take the medication. OK. How long would you take that medication? If you were there for two weeks, would you take it every day? I would. Wonderful. So then they can write a great report to the judge. This patient is adhering to treatment. Let's fast forward now, because they don't let you go back to your home. They want to send you to a group home to be with other mentally ill people. Do you go? Probably not. Probably not? Where do you go instead? Probably not. Probably, uh, if I don't have a home to go to, I'd probably live in my car. Ten years, five years go by. You never see Eleanor again. You never see your home again. Do you think you'd come to understand you are not married to her, that you have a mental illness? I believe I would. In five years, really? That's all it would take? Did you propose marriage? Yes. That didn't happen. You really think in five years you could come to believe that the memory that you're having right now of that proposal never happened? Or the wedding? Do you think you could be really convinced that all of that was just a dream? Probably not. Yeah. Thank you for your help. Can we thank Richard for helping me? Thank you. Real quickly, any emotions that you had as we were doing this? I know it's a role play. Fleeting emotions. Just name one. Resistance. Resistance. How about any anger or fear? Yes. Yes. OK, thank you for, again for your help. Let's thank him again. And please call Eleanor when this is over. OK. That's what it's like. This is a fixed, firm belief. It's, it's concrete. It's solid. It's in Richard's bones. He knows he's married to Eleanor. And that's what it's like for millions of Americans with these serious mental illnesses. So when dealing with somebody who has anisognosia for mental illness, not denial of mental illness, the doctor knows best, or the father or mother knows best, or the little brother in my case, doesn't work. There's no collaboration. Can I expect Richard to be Grateful? Were you grateful for my advice? No. Receptive? No. He learned how to go underground like my brother did and accept treatment for a month and maybe longer just to get his freedom back. This is what happens, again, to millions of Americans with these illnesses. Adherence refers to medication adherence, medication compliance. Like, again, 50% of patients, he's very unlikely to take medication. When I can expect, what the research shows us is that we will get somebody who is Fearful, angry, suspicious, demoralized, lonely, and who will not take the medication. So how do I deal with them? Well, the approach is, believe it or not, I told you earlier that this is about relationships. We have to create respectful, non-judgmental relationships. These, the research shows, result in acceptance of treatment. For an illness, the person doesn't believe they have. So if Richard comes to me five years from now, and he tells me his story, I would Listen to it with respect and without judgment. The L in LEAP stands for listening reflectively, again, with respect and without judgment. So after he tells me his story, I would say, so you went to that TEDx talk, and they took away your wife, your home, everything? Did I understand you correctly? Which would be very different than what he had been hearing, which is, you know, Richard, we want you to calm down. We've got to keep you away from Eleanor. And what we've learned through doing a lot of research is that People with these illnesses feel relief. Now, this is not dishonest. I'm not pretending I believe. I'm simply reflecting back his experience. I would empathize with Richard strategically, especially with the emotions around the delusions. It must be terrible to have this happen. How was it for you? Well, I was resistant. Were you angry? Yes, I was angry. You know what, Richard? I'd be angry, too. We work on those things we could agree on. It's never going to be that Richard is not married to Eleanor. That's a delusion. We've known that for 60 years. We don't try to talk people out of their delusions. Well, we also don't try to talk people out of their anosognosia, their unawareness of mental illness. We partner on what we can work on together. There's three other tools we use, but again, the focus is respectful, non-judgmental communication. So with my brother, so mom's the devil and her eyes are laser beams, is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, no wonder you're so terrified of her. I would be too, Henry, if this happened to me. Those are the kind of conversations I had with him. If he asked me, 
do you really believe this? If Richard asked me, do you really believe I'm sick? I might delay. We call it the three A's. I apologize for my opinion. I acknowledge my fallibility. Agree to disagree. What does that sound like? Richard, I'll answer the question if you want me to. But I want to apologize. I might upset you, and I could be wrong. I hope we don't have to argue. When we give our opinion, we're using those three tools. And then we're not afraid to apologize for things like previous confrontations, like I did with my brother. Apologize for things like an involuntary hospitalization that we were a part of. Sometimes people will say, why are you repeating everything I say? The research shows that you can apologize for that. I'm sorry. I'm repeating everything. I just want to understand you. I wasn't listening before. I kept telling you you were ill. I'd like to listen. So it's a very different approach. It's not the medical model approach. It's the motivational interviewing approach. It's a whole other field of study. And I'll end with some closure on the story of my brother. I lost sight of who my brother was in those seven years that we fought. He was a mature, kind, selfless person. He died being Henry Amador. He was safely on a city bus when he heard a woman behind him struggling with groceries. He got off the bus, got on the sidewalk, and was handing her groceries when someone who had lost control of their car ran him down. He saved that woman's life. It was an act of kindness that he was engaged in uh, when his life ended. He had a very good life for those 18 years. He had a girlfriend, he had work, and he had his relationships back, as that picture I showed you, I think, demonstrates best. So how we approach people who have these illnesses, who say I'm not sick, is vitally important, and the relationships we build are the key. Thank you. Often this counterintuitive thing, um, and I'm curious to get people's thoughts and, and feedback on that video, but it's this counterintuitive piece that, you know, we can actually leave the leave it behind that this person, you know, needs to acknowledge the illness or needs to to accept treatment. If you leave that behind and, and work on building that connection, it actually ends up increasing the likelihood that somebody then seeks out treatment. We've done uh, research too, looking at, you know, especially during something like CBT, um, what some of the best predictors are that somebody's going to have a reduction in symptoms. And one of the most critical um, mechanisms, basically, of symptoms reducing is how connected somebody feels to other, to other people, whether it's to the therapist, the care team, usually it's other people in their life. So the more connected and the more the, of that social connection that's there, you actually see the symptoms start to dissipate more. Um, oftentimes, even if you become the target of, of an unusual belief, you know, oftentimes that target not the target, but you know, the fact that that belief is about you can stem from the fact that the person is feeling disconnected from you or feeling somehow unsafe in that relationship. And so instead of working on that belief directly, if you can reconnect, rebuild that relationship, um, rebuild that social connection, you see that belief start to dissipate. Those are that and, you know, some of the research on, on, India and the family support there, those are all the reasons I say, you know, probably the best thing we can do as family and, and caregivers is really focus on, on making that connection with your loved one as, as strong as it can possibly be. I'm curious to hear if anybody has thoughts or comments on that though, and on the video. What if the person is difficult to connect to? She's very disruptive, has bad hygiene and is very argumentative. She's just difficult. How do you make a connection? It's a great question, and certainly some people are going to be more challenging to connect with than others. You know, a starting point can be to think, and, and maybe some of the cognitive therapy stuff I'm going to jump to in a minute might help, but, uh, you know, a starting point can be to think about what is the underlying emotion that that person is feeling, you know, when they're being difficult, when they're, you know, whether it's irritable, you know, they're acting out in some way, whatever it might be, if they're overtly aggressive, Often it can be helpful to think, you know, what is it that they're feeling in that moment? You know, probably anger, but might be feeling threatened, unsafe, might be feeling afraid. Oftentimes with psychosis, you get uh, an over uh, compensation for those feelings of vulnerability and, and fear. And, you know, if we can empathize with that and try and do what we can 
if that is what's coming up for somebody, help them feel safe in that moment. The more we can do things together, and there's a slide that I might skip over, but hopefully I'm gonna send, I'll send Joni my slides and maybe you can send those out to everybody. One of the best ways to build connection is to do something where you have a common goal. So not just, you know, do something together like an activity. So, you know, oftentimes, I mean, really wonderful things to do, but oftentimes I see, you know, the goal is really to get your loved one out into the into the community. So maybe you take them, you know, to the grocery store, you try and take them shopping, you try and get you know, out doing different things. That's it's great because you're doing something together. But in terms of building connection, if that's your goal, the best way to build connection is to have a shared goal that you both want to accomplish and then work together to accomplish that goal. So it might be, you know, if you can, if the person likes games, you know, sometimes doing a cooperative game, not a game where you compete against each other, but if it's a cooperative game, you're working together. If the person likes building things, you know, work together to, we've had people like build model cars and that together. Um, you're accomplishing that or something artistic or creative, you know, whatever it is, if you can build off of the person's interest and then work on something together, you know, it's the only way that we have, um, it, there's a bunch of social psychology research on this, but um, it's really the only way that you can get people who have very different political opinions or who are, you know, very, you know, exclusionary or stigmatizing or discriminatory to change those types of beliefs. But if you work together on some sort of common goal, it's your best chance of, you know, starting to build that connection. I think some of the issues are that some of the families do not live with their family members. And so trying to communicate with them is very difficult. And trying to even, you know, get them to meet with them is very difficult. So yeah. what would you do in that situation? So again, you know, one of the one of the best things and you know, we run into this as, as care providers too. Um, one of the best things you can do is be consistent. And it might be very, very slow. You know, if you've got somebody who's not even interested in, in talking with you or, or seeing you or spending time with you, it's really hard to do. I mean, it activates a lot in us. And uh, I'll show you something that might be helpful from a CBT perspective in a minute. But in terms of, you know, getting that connection, building that connection back, consistency is your best friend. So even if the person doesn't want to see you, you know, even if you get a really negative response, that's really hurtful. That, and, you know, that can happen a lot. The more that you're there and the more that you're consistently showing that you're there, you know, even if they don't necessarily want to see you, that they can count on you to, to be there. I worked with a, a, a family member who described it as, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep bothering this person and, you know, bo bother them in the nicest way possible, you know, not, not actually bother them, but I'm just going to keep bothering this person in the sense that I'm going to constantly be there, you know, letting them know I care about them, letting them know that they can come to me. Um, took, took months. I think it took like six to eight months to even get the person willing to, to, you know, sit down and, and, even be in the same room for a bit of time but the constant you know stopping by seeing if they were okay respecting you know their their decisions just letting them know that you know i'm there for you um eventually you know feels like you can really trust that person and and, and start to at least have a little bit of a relationship there so it's not easy from you know from your end as, as the as the family member because you might be exposed to some really hurtful things that the person says during all of that you know it might seem like the person's trying to push you away and doesn't want anything to do with you oftentimes that's a little bit of testing on on their part too and you know if we can show them that no matter what you know we're there for them it helps to helps to build that connection but it can be especially if you're at that point with somebody and and you know, it can take a, a while to, to build that connection. This is just a quick note that um, this is the book that Dr. Amador has written. I'm not sick. I don't need help. Um, if you don't have it or haven't looked at it, you know, I think we've already heard that it's highly recommended and I would recommend it too. And you know what? I just got notification um, that uh, a new book has just come out. So I will send it out to everybody. Um, my American friends have just sent me a new um book that has that they have just received from dr amador wonderful so, 
There's also, if you're interested in this book, there is a, it's not the whole book, but I think it's about three quarters of the book that's available for free on online through the uh, National Alliance for, for Mental Illness website, uh, NAMI uh, in the US. So there is, a, there is a PDF online. It doesn't have all of it, but it has a, a substantial amount of it. There's a few things that I tend to find get in the way for people of, of being able to build that connection. The, the self-care piece is, is one of them. And you know, it's hard caring for somebody who's going through something like psychosis. Really important, you know, to be taking care of yourself at the same time. Because if you're wore down, if you're run down and exhausted, emotionally drained, you know, it makes it that much harder. If we're talking about that consistency and you know, constantly showing up constantly being there for the person to build that connection that becomes really hard maybe even impossible if you're you know completely drained and, and emotionally um, exhausted so you know, people have probably heard this analogy before but you know on the airplane you're always told to put on your own oxygen mask first before you put it on somebody else same thing when you're caring for somebody who has a you know especially a serious mental health condition like this, you've got to make sure you're in a, in a decent place so that you can support them in, in the best way that you possibly can. Oftentimes there's barriers that come up from a cognitive perspective that get in the way of actually being able to do the self-care, being able to build that connection, being able to have that consistency and, and you know, keep showing up for your, for your loved one. And they can take a lot of different forms, but you know, Oftentimes when we're thinking about self-care, um, this is one I hear a lot, but you know, if I'm not there for my loved one 24 seven, then I'm a bad parent. If I'm not doing everything I could possibly be doing, then I'm a bad person. Um, you know, if I ask for help or support in, in caring for this loved one, then I'm weak. If I take any time for myself, I'm selfish. Other thoughts that, that can get in the way of building that connection, you know, if they don't take medicine, then they'll never recover. That's one that gets in the way of being able to use that leak technique or being able to step back from that need for the person to, to be symptom free. You know, if you think about all three of those domains of recovery, it's very possible for people to live a, a, a very full life, even if some of those symptoms are, are still there. And so the more pressure we put on ourselves and on our loved one to seek help to um, you know, be symptom free, oftentimes the, the more that that can actually backfire on us. So as we think about these cognitive barriers, you know, it's helpful to think through if any of these come up for you, there's probably lots of other ones that, that might come up. And if you hold any of these beliefs, it's probably going to change how you actually act and interact with your loved one as well. This is our, our basic cognitive model. This is the exact same model that we work with people in CBTP on. Um, and it's relatively simple, but it's very powerful once you actually get the hang of thinking about your situations in, in this way. But we always start with a situation. So something happens, you know, for someone with psychosis, it might be the voice says something to me, you know, for a family member, it might be, you know, my loved one, uh, is hearing voices again, or my loved one is, uh, you know, my loved one yells at me, or my loved one accuses me of something. The, the key piece from cognitive therapy is how you interpret that situation. And you could imagine people interpret those situations in, in lots of different ways. You know, if you interpret, we'll go through a couple of examples, but if you interpret your loved one, you know, yelling at you as they're, they're sick again, you know, they need to go to the hospital, that's probably a very different reaction than if you think they're yelling at me because they feel unsafe right now, or they're yelling at me because our connection has been ruptured in some way. And, you know, they're feeling disconnected from me right now. A different interpretation in that situation is probably going to lead to different emotional responses in us, different things that we actually do. And different things that we do in that situation may be more or less helpful for our loved one as well. This is, you know, we walk through this in the exact same way if you're, if you're hearing voices, you know, how do you interpret the voices? How do you feel when you interpret the voices in that way? What do you do? And, you know, if you interpret the voices as being God, that's very different than if you interpret the voices as, uh, you know, being a neighbor. It might be very different if you interpret the voices as not being anything, but just, you know, being very annoying. It might lead to very different things that you do in that situation. In this example, you know, so um, your loved one interrupts you watching um, your 
this was an example in a different slide, but um, watching Survivor, if you're into Survivor, um, and in a lot of distress about the voices. If you interpret that as, you know, she needs my help, it's my responsibility to help her all the time, you know, you might feel stressed, you might take that pressure on yourself and, you know, turn off the TV, help her use those coping strategies, help her get through whatever distress is going on right then and there. That is perfect, you know, very thoughtful, a wonderful thing to do. But if that comes up every time, and if you're trying to, you know, have a little bit of self-care time for yourself by watching Survivor, you might want to think about, you know, are there other ways that we could think about that situation that might give you some of that self-care time? And if that's what's coming up, you know, these are a bunch of questions that, that you can try and ask yourself to think, is there a different way I could make sense of the situation here? So, you know, if it was your best friend who, who was going through this and, you know, they were so stressed, they really needed just a little bit of time to themselves to watch Survivor, what would you tell them to do? You know, any past experiences, have there been any times when, you know, your loved one was so distressed about voices, it seemed like they needed your help, but maybe they were actually able to get through it on their own. Is there anything that would suggest that you have to be the one to help them 100% of the time? Is there anything you've learned from previous experiences that might change your interpretation of what's going on? And one of the biggest ones is the very bottom one there. Am I acting or interpreting the situation out of some sort of habit that's formed um, as opposed to how I actually want to act in that situation? Oftentimes with families and any sort of relationship that you have, we fall into these patterns and we, everybody starts playing your own role in that relationship, whether that role is, you know, you as the one who's always helping your loved one or your loved one who's always, you know, in the power role telling you to, you know, F off and leave them alone. You fall into these habits and those habits can be hard to change. But the more we work to change how we act in a relationship, you know, the more we can start to change the relationship dynamic in general. So, you know, if you really need some self-care time, you could think of, you know, instead of the interpretation that she needs my help right now, I have to do everything in this moment to, to help her, you know, maybe you could view it as, yeah, she has coping strategies and this isn't an emergency situation. So, you, have, you know, if it's an emergency of something like suicide or other self-harm, uh, is, a, is a potential there. This might not apply. But if it's not an emergency situation, maybe she has the coping strategies to, to try it on her own. And instead of, you know, it's my responsibility to help all the time, you know, I'm here to support, um, but I also need to be able to take some time to myself too and set these boundaries so that I have some self-care time as well. And you can see if you believe one of these over the other, it probably leads to a very different behavioral response. This, you know, this is another common one that I think comes up for, for family members and, and caregivers that, you know, your loved one stops taking medication, um, which is very understandably very concerning. You know, if you interpret it as he's sick again, he's going to have a relapse, you know, we're right back where we were before, things are never going to change. You might feel scared. You might think, okay, I need to tell him he's got to get it back on his medication. You might try and push and you know, in the most well-meaning way possible, because you've got his best interests at heart, you know, try and get him back on that medication and taking that medication. But, you know, if we think about what Dr. Amador's talk was about and what we've talked about with connection so far, probably pushing someone to take the medication is more likely to rupture that connection with them than it is to actually get them to take the medication. And, Instead of doing that, you know, we could think about what could we do to build that connection back up and then as a secondary effect of that connection, hopefully the, the treatment starts back up again. Oftentimes in relationships, we end up actually with these two parallel cognitive models that happen. And in these parallel cognitive models, I think on the next one, um, what you end up with is you can think about the exact same process that happens for you as a caregiver happening for your loved one as well. And the problem that can happen with some of these dynamics is it feeds into, if you actually follow all of these arrows through, you'll find it actually forms like an infinity sign. And if this pattern just keeps playing out, it essentially runs until infinity. And you know, it just almost, it keeps feeding off of itself. It keeps getting worse and worse. And I think that's where you can run into the, some of these situations where the relationship really breaks down. So you could imagine, you know, that situation, he stops taking his medication. This is in line a lot, you know, with, with what Dr. Amador talked about. You tell him that he needs to take the medication. 
that then becomes the the trigger event for your loved one you know so you can think about the same process going on for them so you tell them that you know they need to take their medication and how do they interpret it they probably don't interpret it as that you've got their best interests at heart and, and that you care about them um, if they do that's amazing you know you've probably got a really strong connection there i would say more typically i see people interpret it in some way you know she doesn't trust me to to make my own decisions you know um, i'll never be independent i'll never have my life back for a lot of people making these decisions is a way to try and get some of that independence back and if it's interpreted by your loved one in that way you know they probably feel sad angry might get you know yell get upset leave like uh like dr amador's brother did and you know that just feeds this you know this cycle you know less likely to then take medication if he's not in the house or if he's very upset leads to the same thing on our end as a family or caregiver you know we're upset we're trying to push more and that's where we get into these cycles so the best thing we can start to do is think about you know what's getting activated for me in this situation how am i interpreting what's going on can i interpret it differently so you know instead of he's sick again an alternative might be you know he might be unwell but this is his way of asserting his independence and you know i raised him to be independent so i want to support that independence you might not agree with the decision to stop medication but you can support him in, in being independent and making his own decisions instead of things are never going to change you know things are hard right now but he is getting help small things are changing keep in mind that recovery spiral staircase you know we might be back at the same point where we're off the medications but you know we've made a little bit of progress since the last time if you think about things with those alternatives you might be less likely to try and push medication on your loved one more likely you know what would be how would you might how might you act if you know you're thinking okay so this is my independent um you know loved one can i support them in that independence and walk with them you can also ask yourself you know how would you act if the connection between you is the most important thing and i I'm trying to do my best to convince you that that is really the most important thing when it comes to recovery, not, you know, whether or not they're taking medication, not whether or not, you know, they're maintaining treatment, but, you know, really that connection, because that connection will facilitate all of those other things if you give it time. So how would you act if in that moment, the most important thing is your connection with your loved one, rather than making sure that they're, you know, taking their medication right then and there. It's going to be different for all of us, but I think these are the questions that are helpful to ask when you're presented with situations like this. The other thing you can do is think, you know, what's getting activated for your loved one in this situation? So, you know, if we're trying to suggest, you know, take the medication, we're probably hoping that our loved one sees our care that's there, sees that we care and we're trying to help, sees that, you know, maybe we have a more objective view of things than they do and, and hoping that they trust us in that moment to, to start taking the medication back that might be asking a lot of them though and if they don't respond well that's probably not what they're thinking in the moment they might be thinking you know one of those other things that you know she doesn't trust me or you know she doesn't uh support my independence uh things are never going to change uh, in our relationship either and if that's the case, if we can think about what's getting activated for our loved one, we can start to think about how can we empathize with that? How can we come up with a response that's actually going to help alleviate those concerns in so, some way? So, you know, instead of trying to really push the medication, you know, I want you to know that I trust you and support you in the decisions that you make. You know, my view is that the medications are helpful for you, but I support you as an independent person and, you know, uh, I, I want us to, to work together on this. Those types of responses might not work perfectly every time, but I think is much more in line with that leap technique um, from Dr. Amador and, and is all designed to help build this connection and maintain the connection. Because there's always going to be conflict in any relationship and it's getting through that conflict, managing that in a way that doesn't really uh, you know, rupture that uh, social connection that you have with your loved one there when conflicts do come up you know it's often very hard because a lot of things have been activated in us and you know maybe hurtful things have been said towards us maybe we've acted in ways that uh, are not how we might like to act in the situation but 
you know, with the leap technique, and I think it's a, a good rule of thumb, apologizing is always our best friend, you know, apologizing if we made somebody upset, apologizing that maybe we didn't understand where they were coming from. Even if we think we know better, or even if we think we know a better way to think about it for them, you know, we can apologize that we didn't understand their point of view, or uh, we can apologize that that we made things worse, or, or you know, said something that upset them. The more that we can apologize, put ourselves on equal footing with our loved ones, you know, the more that it does to to help repair any connection that might break during a, a conflict like that. If possible, as well, you know. It's helpful to ask questions about how your loved one interpreted the, the situation. Probably they interpreted, if it gets to a conflict level, they probably interpreted it in a way that we're not aware of. Um, and if we can become aware of that, we might be able to work together in the future for how do we handle this. You know, maybe what gets activated for them is, you know, you don't care about me. Um, that's a very powerful one. And so, you know, in the future, what can I do, even if we're arguing or in disagreement about something that that would help you to know that I do care about you because I, I do care and I, I really want you to know that I care. But thinking about what it is from that interpretation and cognitive perspective that gets activated in our loved one can help with those relationship dynamics. I'm gonna end on this note and I'm very happy you know, for, for some discussion, but it's, it's the biggest reason that I tend to say I, I'm not a big fan of approaches for you know you as family and caregiver to try and do the CVTP yourself because it runs the risk of of putting a little bit of a block in that connection. I, I really think that the most important thing you can do is do everything you can to build that connection up. And from a cognitive perspective, you know, thinking about what gets activated in both yourself when when it gets hard to to maintain that connection and what might be getting activated in your in your loved one that might be making it hard for for that relationship. So I really think connection is the key and i think quite honestly even when it's really really hard you guys are in the best position to build that connection you know as a as a healthcare provider as a therapist we can have some kind of connection but the real connection is going to come from you and in your loved one's life and taking care of yourself you know thinking through all of this making sure you're in a place where you can really provide that connection for your loved one uh, I, I think is key for this recovery process. And, you know, it's possible for everyone. It's a journey and you often end up on that journey with, with your loved one, especially when it's really hard. It can be hard to keep that hope, but, you know, there is always that hope and, you know, it's, it's very possible for, for everyone who's going through psychosis. There are lots of cognitive problems that we face. A lot of errors in thinking, judgment and feelings. Another is an exaggeration of negative personality traits. Can CBT or cognitive remediation help? It is a really good question, and it's a complex question. It's actually, we've got a new trial starting up in the new year that looks at combining both CBT and, and cognitive remediation, and it's one of the, the questions that we're, we're hoping to answer with that. Um, Typically, it depends on what's getting in the way of those processes. So, you know, if somebody's having a hard time remembering or focusing or paying attention and socializing because the, the voices are just there nonstop talking away and are so distracting, that's probably more something that CBT is going to help with because we're going to focus on, you know, working with the voices, quieting the voices down you know, getting that focus more external towards things that are going on around you and, and you know, being able to remember that information. <laughs> For some people, you know, it might not be something like voices or unusual beliefs that's making that hard. It might be, you know, some people um, with psychosis have uh, a core cognitive impairment that's there. And so it's just, you know, you have more, pro you have more difficulty just inherently with attention, memory, problem solving ability, planning ability. If it's more a presentation like that, we would typically think cognitive remediation is what's gonna help. And so what we can do with that is directly target those skills like attention, memory, problem solving, improve that. And you know, presumably through that, we help people in terms of being able to function in everyday life, live independently and, and do all of those tasks. In practice with clients, it's not always terribly easy to differentiate you know what is the cause of of all of these difficulties someone's experiencing which is where this new trial that we're starting where we're looking at combining cbt and cognitive remediation and i'm 
quite hopeful that's going to be even more effective for people. There are many families that are struggling. They're at home dealing with delusions or hallucinations and they're struggling to maintain a home life, but also trying to figure out when would be the best time to take that person to the hospital. It's a very fragile situation. You're not sure if they're a harm to themselves and others. You have all these gray areas and what psychiatrists look at when taking the person to the hospital where they may or may not be admitted. What are your thoughts? It depends a lot, at least in my view, you know, I think there's a very clear line. If somebody is, you know, really considering suicide or serious self-harm or there's risk to somebody else because of like unusual beliefs that have come up, you know, I think that's a very clear line, you know, that's make sure you, you get your loved one to the hospital in that case. The the flip side, as we get into the gray areas, hospitalizations aren't always terribly fun for, for people. And it's not always a, a, you know, it is something to, to consider because it's not a, often a, a pleasant experience, unfortunately. So as we get into these gray areas, you know, maybe somebody stops taking medication and, you know, the unusual beliefs start to take over and it becomes, you know, much more complex at home. You know, Getting somebody to the hospital can be useful to get them back on meds and, and get stabilized in that way. Um, I think a lot of it, it can also be, you know, that like Dr. Amador talked about in that uh, TED talk, that can serve to disrupt the connection in your relationship with that person to some extent. And so it's always going to be a balance. I think a big part of it too is your own resources and where you're at as a family member, because if you're feeling like you can handle it, with whatever is going on with your loved one right now and you can cope and your loved one's not in any imminent danger or risk you know it's probably more helpful to be able to keep them at home if you're you know at the end of your rope you know you don't have the the resources there and i think that's where it's really important to be honest with ourselves and, and you know check in with ourselves about what we're capable of in in that moment because these situations are so hard you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with with taking the your you know your loved one to the hospital. In a lot of ways, that might be the the most beneficial environment for them in in that situation, and it might be helpful for for you to be able to you know get your energy back up too. So, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. No, there isn't. Everyone's situation is different, but it's a challenging time for families because they're in a quandary of what to do. Is the the right time or the wrong time? It's very difficult. The other thing to, to think about, too, is what other, you know, healthcare resources do you have available to you? Because, you know, if you if your loved one's in therapy, you know, hopefully you've got a therapist who's who's helping with enough of this stuff. If your loved one, you know, is part of, a, you know, whether it's an ACT team or like an early psychosis program that hopefully is a little bit more intensive that way, you know, relying on those supports is supposed to be a way that, you know, hopefully you can keep the, the person at home with you and, and have more of those resources available to you. I know that's not always the case in reality, unfortunately, but, you know, if you've got some other supports like that, those, you know, rely on those as well to help you. I worry about the long-term impact of staying off of medication. It, you know, it's a very rightful thing to, to worry about. Um, you do know that the longer typically that people go um, with, without treatment of some kind. Um, we don't know whether that's, you know, specifically, um, you know, meds versus something like CBT. But the longer people go without treatment, the, the harder it can be to, to come back from that. So it, it's a very reasonable thing to, to be concerned about, especially if, you know, it's, it's all treatment together that, that people don't have. The challenge and this is where it gets really hard from a family perspective because you know that and you know that they're you know you, you really want people having some type of, of treatment and support and, and they're refusing it the challenge is you know the more we push that the less likely you are to actually um, be able to get that person that treatment and support and you know that Dr. Amador's talk it, it wasn't until he actually stopped pushing that and stopped all of that disagreement focused on the connection that his brother actually you know got more involved consistently with with treatment and things really turned for him so it's those are the challenging ones where you know you know that that's how you're you know think about that as one of those cognitive pieces that comes up that 
you know, if you're really in the mindset that he needs to be in treatment because, you know, the longer he's not, the, the worse it could be for him, um, you know, you're going to feel a lot of pressure to get him in treatment and, and, and force that, um, which might actually serve to disrupt your connection with him. So it, it doesn't have to. If you can work together to get that treatment, that, you know, you can actually build that connection. But you want to be careful that you're not disrupting that connection. Of course, you know, if it is a serious situation, you know, if he's left the house, if he's, you know, um, living on the streets or, you know, something really extreme is potentially going to happen, you might need to, you know, get him the help and, you know, think about involuntary hospitalization. But, but short of that, you know, the connection hopefully is where the, you know, this treatment seeking will end up coming from. It's yeah. also very reasonable to have discussions with your loved one about meds too, in the sense of, or about any treatment that, you know, you think it would be very helpful. You know, you would, you think, you know, you'd really like them on it, but, you know, you understand why they might not want to take it or, you know, why they might not want to seek treatment. The more you can have those collaborative discussions, the more you can maintain that connection and still put the idea out there around treatment. Sorry, is the question is CBT being done while people are like inpatient uh, in a yeah. hospital? Um, so it is um, not everywhere, that's for sure. Um, and part of the issue that this is one of the issues we're trying to work on in Ontario right now, um, there's not great continuity of care when it comes to CBT when people leave the hospital after an inpatient stay. So people might get started on CBT, but hopefully people aren't there for like six months or the duration that we would want CBT to go on for. And there's not a great plan from almost any hospital that I'm aware of right now to transition people um, when they get back out into the community to keep uh, you know, seeing a CBT therapist. So at least at this point, most hospitals, it tends to be, you know, you get some CBT while you're hospitalized, but then you have to seek out a different therapist once you um, are discharged, um, which is very far from ideal. If you can, you know, be followed by the same therapist, um, we've seen that at a couple of places where they've been able to follow people um, from, you know, start the work in hospital, follow people to outpatient. That tends to be way more successful. Um, we've had some kind of amazing stories of people who have been, you know, hospitalized every month for like 20 years. And you get this approach where you start in hospital, have the same therapist when you go outpatient. We've got one client I'm thinking of right now who's now two years without a hospitalization, um, which is you know a huge improvement for him. Uh, there's another question: Do you do you go into delving into stress before birth? Making sure that I understand this: Are we talking about you know stress to like a, a a fetus in utero sort of thing? Is that what we're talking about here, and potential risk for psychosis, or is the question about something else? Okay, that's what the question is about. Um, we don't typically talk about that in CBT, although it's certainly something, you know, when we think about risk factors for, for psychosis um, and other conditions, both mental health and physical health, you know, um, stress and, you know, not just generic stress, but also, you know, stress in the, in the form of like infections and that stress on the body when, when uh, a fetus is in utero um, does increase the, the chances of developing a, a either, you know, a mental health or physical health condition later. Um, but certainly there's a, a link with psychosis there. We don't tend to talk about that a lot in the actual therapy that we do with clients though. Dr. Best uh, will be sending his, his slides to, to us and, and some recommendations for, um, therapist that that would be um, a good fit for our group and also some of his um, research that he's doing um, that you could participate in. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for your time and uh, your thought-provoking, very interesting um, presentation. Uh, you know, a lot of people are struggling. They're not sure how to talk to their loved ones. They're not sure what to do in some of these very, very stressful situations. And I think you shed some light on some things that we would, it would help us a lot. So I really appreciate all the information that you gave and we'd be happy to get the slides and thank you so much.
Well, thank you for having me, Joni. It's such great work that, that you do, and you're, you're such a great support for, for everyone. So, um, uh, you know, everyone, please do feel free to reach out at, at any point to me as well if you have any questions. And I will send everyone your um, information and, you know, Wonderful. reach out to Dr. Best or myself, and I will send some of your questions to him. Um, and with that, have a, a safe evening, and, and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And you know what? It's a recovery for everybody and everyone has their own journey. But you know, you must you must remember to take care of yourself. It's important. Put that oxygen mask on. Um, and with that, I'm gonna say good night. <laughs>